is a research acoustician working with the Passive Acoustics Group at NOAA Fisheries in Woodholes, Massachusetts, uh, USA. He has a Bachelor of Science in Acoustics and Signal Processing from Le Mans University in France, as well as a Master's of Science in Oceanography from the University of Quebec in Roski, and a PhD in Earth and Ocean Sciences from the University of Victoria. Uh, his research interests include the development of hardware and software tools for the automatic detection, classification, and localization of marine fauna using passive acoustics, and the analysis of marine soundscapes. Thank you. Can you um, see my presentation okay and hear me fine? Yep. Wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you. So today I'm going to present some work I've done uh, for my PhD at uh, UVic. Um, and that was under the supervision of Francis Juana Standoso um, from UVic. Um, but also this project had lots of collaborators. So Morgan Black, Kieran Cox, Jessica Kelly, who really helped with the diving operations um, of the data set I'm going I'm to present. Um, and also Dana Garty, Sarah Dudas from DFO on the machine learning part I'm going to present, uh, as well as Stephanie Archer from uh, LumCon. Um, so today it's going to be pretty uh, like a high again, level. I'm not going to go into detail on the the machine learning part. Um, let's see, I can't find. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is going to be like kind of two parts. The first part is kind of describing this co-located audio and video um, data set, um, kind of give some background about why we collected this, uh, what are our current um, processing uh, steps, um, and then some results, and then what's next. In the second part, I'll kind of touch on how machine learning can help make um, the collection of these data more uh, valuable, and so we can make passive acoustic monitoring uh, like a re really useful tool for, uh, for helping monitoring fish. Um, and to get started, I'll kind of, it's not always uh, known that fish make sound, but it's actually quite common. Uh, we all often associate fish sound to like the tropics. Uh, but actually, uh, if you have some, if you put some hydrophones in British Columbia, there are tons of fish sounds. Um, so here I'm going to play a few examples of um, acoustic data that have been collected at different places. And I'll, I'll get started with the one um, on top, the Adagwai uh, hydrophone. So the buzzing sound that you hear are fish sounds that were recorded by a cable hydrophone. If you go south in the Great Bear Rainforest, you have different type of sounds. And then finally, in the Strait of Georgia off Hornby Island. So all of these sounds that I played are fish sounds. Um, but now when I discovered that um, from the, the acoustic recordings, I sent several uh, samples of data to many researchers around the world and tried to find out like what species they are. And basically the common answer was, yeah, it's pretty sure that it's fish, but we have actually no idea like which species. And so that really triggered my interest because um, I didn't realize that first that was such, uh, so unknown, but also like if we don't know the species, then that's really a roadblock for using passive acoustics uh, to monitor fish, just like we do for the whale, for example. And so what um, that, that became kind of the main topic of my research is like try to identify the sound to specific fish species. Uh, one obvious way to do it is to take fish uh, in their habitat and put them in tanks. Um, deploy a hydrophone and try to see if they make any sounds. Uh, and it sometimes work, um, but uh, very often uh, fish don't like to be taken out of their habitat and actually don't vocalize in, uh, in captivity. Um, there's also many other problems due to acoustic propagation in tanks. And so the sound that if, if the fish is, is vocalizing in the tank, um, the sound that you will actually record might be distorted enough that it's not going to be uh, it will not have the same characteristics of what you would uh, record in the wild. So the, the logical step would be to go in the, in, the, in the field, so in the wild. So here you put like an acoustic recorder on the seafloor of the ocean um, and then listen. In addition, you need to have some sort of visual data, so cameras, um, to see what's going on around your recorder. So here you see an acoustic recorder that was deployed uh, of Hornby Island that was uh, recording continuously for a, a few months. Um, and this 
uh, picture was taken just by GoPro. So the concept is like, I guess, if you hear uh, fish sounds and you look at your camera footage, and if you see a fish, then that must be the one producing the sound. Um, so if you see on the bottom right, on the bottom left, sorry, um, you see a black eye goby. And so if you have a sound uh, in your acoustic recordings, then you say, okay, that's, that's from that fish. The thing is, if you look around, then there's many other fish around your recorder. In fact, there's nothing that tells you that there's no fish behind the field of view of the camera that is making the sound. So having audio and video uh, is um, necessary, uh, but you're doing one more step. You need to be able to know precisely like where the sound is coming from to be able to not mislabel or misidentify the, the sound producer. Um, and so that was kind of the main kind of requirements of my research is like using video cameras, using acoustic recorders, but also do acoustic localization that is precise enough in three dimensions that you can um, yeah, localize any sound. And then if it's in the field of view of the camera, you look at it and you can precisely identify who's making the sound and kind of build up this catalog of fish sounds for, for each species. Um, for this specific purpose, I, I, I had to design hardware and software that were like autonomous and portable. So I can come back to those different places on the BC coast, uh, but also uh, have something that is easily reproducible. So all the effort I've put in putting those things together um, can be reproduced everywhere else in, in the world because the, it's not just a, an issue in BC, it's there's many sounds from fish around the world that are not identified. So there's a real need for this work. Um, so these are kind of the three arrays I came up with. Um, there's the large array, the mini array, and the mobile array. Um, the large array is uh, made out of PVC, uh, a PVC frame. It's about two meters by two meters wide um, and three meters high. Uh, there's an acoustic recorder in the middle uh, connected to six omnidirectional headphones. So with those, we can do localization. There's a fish cam um, camera on the top and on the side. And those are systems that we've developed that can record for a couple of weeks at a time. And then basically we deploy that for on the seafloor for a couple of weeks, um, record both types of data and then do localization and, um, and identify fish sounds. It's a nice system, but it's uh, relatively big and not always appropriate for the habitats uh, that we want to explore. So. The second array, the mini array, is kind of a smaller version of it. It's just one side camera and a four hydrophone uh, recorder. So we can still do localization a little bit less accurately than with the bigger frame, but it's easier to deploy. It's less costly. Uh, and also you're able to deploy it in um, bottoms, like areas that are more, with more like rugged bottoms and between rocks. And so kind of target different fish and different habitats. And then, the smallest unit is the mobile array, which is um, like a four hydrophone um, recorder, but this time it's not static, it's mobile and it's put on top of an underwater drone, or like on a remotely operated vehicle. Autonomy is much smaller, it's a, a matter of a few hours, but this time you only need one person to operate it and you can really like explore within the crevices and basically target even like more rugged um, areas and, and target different fish. We deployed those instruments as five different locations on the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island. And we collected about like total of uh, 50 days of, uh, of continuous data. Now, how we analyze this data. Uh, first, so we, um, we have acoustic data. So here it's an example with uh, six channels. We pick one channel. Uh, so typically the hydrophone in the middle of the array and perform acoustic detection on it. So we, not targeting anything specific because we don't want to have any a priori. We don't have, we don't really know what we're looking for. In other words, we want to detect any transients in the spectrogram and then we'll see if those are actually from fish. So that's just an example here of a simple like detector um, on the spectrogram. We draw like time and frequency boxes on different acoustic events that were detected. Now that we have that, then for each of the events, you calculate the time difference of arrival of that sound between each pair of hydrophones. And with this, you can do 3D localization. So that's an example here where you have like an array with six hydrophones and the red dots here with the arrows denote like 
where the localization of the sound uh, and the, uh, the crosses denote like uncertainty in the in the localization process. Then once we have that, then we know that the sound is coming from this specific um, um, location in the array. If it's in the field of view of the camera, then you can have a look at your video data and try to see what was uh, what animal or what what was the source of that sound. And then you can basically associate sound to species and sometimes behavior. And basically you kind of build up this, this catalog of fish sound for each species. Now I'll show you an example of what it looks like just for one of the array. This is the large array. The video that you see here is from the top camera looking down. Um, <clears throat> the square is the, um, the base of the large array. It's about two meters on either side. You have a hydrophone at each corner, one in the middle and some others that you can see. Um, so I'll go through the scene here. You have a link card that is sitting on top of the array here. At the bottom, you see here a quillback rockfish moving towards the middle of the array. Now you're going to hear some fish sounds, which are those pulses. As you heard those fish sound, the link cut went down, the quillback rockfish went to the left. Uh, there was another fish, quillback rockfish, that went to the top here. We hear a second sequence of fish sound here. And then in the meantime of all of this, you had like another quillback rockfish that swam through the array on the top right. Uh, so kind of to summarize, you have one quillback rockfish that started at the bottom and went up. Um, when we heard, we heard two sequences of fish sounds, during the first sequence, this fish was here where the circle is, and it was here during the second sequence of fish sounds. So we kind of do this for each, um, each fish. And basically, if we're able to localize the sound at one of the circles, then we'll be able to identify like who was the, the producer of the sound. So now I'll play that sequence again, shorter. I'll start when the link on is moving. Um, so you have on top the spectrogram of the sound. The vertical bars you see are uh, fish sounds. So you have the first sequence of fish sounds here, and the, sequ the second sequence is here. On the bottom panel, you have the localization results. Here on the left side, you have the side view of the array with the fish cam uh, at the top looking down. This is the bottom. Um, and here you have kind of looking down, basically the same view as the camera. So uh, the square here is the square here. And when I'm going to play this example, you'll see localization results that will appear in the localization plots as dots uh, with arrows that denote uncertainty in the localization. So I'll play that sequence again. So the fish, the quillback rockfish moved to the left when they're link card, um, and that was localized here in the array. Uh, the second sequence of fish sound that is localized on the left of the array, almost outside and at the bottom. And so basically those two sequences were localized exactly where the quillback rockfish was. And so we can tell with certainty that those sounds were actually from quillback rockfish. It's kind of the first page of our fish sound catalog. So I'm not going to go through example of each array because that would take too much time. But basically, with all the deployments in different uh, uh, instruments, we were able to uh, identify sounds from quillback rockfish, copper rockfish, and link cards. And this is new information because no, none of these fish had been um, like reported to produce sound. And so this is um, like new contribution, especially for the BC where it's uh, important. Um, so now that we have these sound snippet like uh, identified, then we can do all kind of measurements. So time frequency characteristics and try to see if, if you just look at the sound, like can you actually distinguish this species from the other? So it kind of the characterization stage, but also we are able to localize so we can kind of back propagate what we hear and try to see what the source level is. So in, in other words, like how loud the fish is. And that leads to like detection range, like how far can you detect these species in such conditions? And this is obviously, obviously like information that is quite useful when you try to design a passive acoustic monitoring program, try to see how far you can detect fish, how many recorders you need and, and so forth. So now why this is useful and, and what's next? Basically long-term, goal of all of this is to try to use passive acoustic monitoring to help marine conservation. One good example, especially in British Columbia, 
is to help uh, monitoring of rockfish conservation areas. So all the yellow patches that you see here on the map are rockfish conservation areas that have been uh, put in place and they're, as the name says, they try to basically protect uh, rockfishes. Um, but it's hard to know if those are actually- Javier, we're gonna have to cut you off in about a minute. Sure. Um, so we don't really know if those are efficient. And so we try to make passive acoustic, um, try to see if passive acoustic can help monitor those uh, areas. So if we want to do this, we need instruments. We need fish sounds a catalog that those both of these we have, but we also need efficient data processing and try to see if we can find out fish density. Um, that leads to the second part uh, of the talk is like, can actually machine learning help? I'll go pretty quickly because I don't have much time, but basically we built like more traditional machine learning algorithm that are able to um, detect fish sounds and tell them <clears throat> apart from noise. Um, and we tested those on a, a, a data set of a bit more than 97,000 annotated calls and noise samples. Um, we have a fairly decent accuracy. So we have like, we catch basically 80% um, of the fish calls, but we also have like 20% of false alarms, which can sometimes be problematic. Still being useful to kind of learn more. I'm not going to go through this graph because of time, but basically, and now we're in the process as I speak, there's a deep learning model that is training and basically try to shift that curve up the top right uh, and basically have a, a better uh, detector. So now it's nice to detect fish versus no fish, but it's it's not quite enough. We need to know what species are making this. So we have we are collecting and identify fish sounds, but our data set is still limited. So we're building that effort. It's still ongoing. And so the next step will be to build detector or classifiers that can actually distinguish each species. And that's something we're working on um, here. And will be some updates. And finally, um, where I can see machine learning being really useful is tracking fish in those video cameras, uh, video data, because we need to know like how often those fish um, produce sound and how many of fish are in the, in the area and which one are vocalizing. And so you can track those fish manually, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, so if we have like an automated process that tracks those fish and then you can calculate basically like a, uh, for that fish, how often it produces sound, how many fish are in the area. With this, you can get an estimate of the cure rate, and the cure rate is a key component, a key measurement that can help you estimate density and number of fish in the area just using like acoustic recorders. Um, this is work that we have not started yet, um, but I'm uh, really looking forward to the other talks and see what's what's existing and what what we can uh, use. And that's about it. Thanks to everyone.